dar início, então, vocês... Ok, let's uh, start this uh, webinar. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, second edition of the cycle of the exchange of experiences for family farming. Before starting, this uh, meeting has some kind of interpretation into Spanish, English, French, Arabic, and Portuguese. Colleagues, yeah. just to let you know, uh, we have uh, interpretation services available in five languages, so take the opportunity to uh, use this service. E essa atividade this activity is part of FAO's uh, effort to support the implementation of the United Nations a decade of uh, family farming at the global level and will be developed through the regional technical platform on family farming. Facilitated by the FAO Regional Office for Latin America and the Caribbean. And this is part of a network uh, of a global initiative facilitated by FAO in all five regions. This is a uh, family farming specific uh, platform coordinated together with our colleagues from the unit of family farming, the parliamentary networks and the communication for development led by Guilherme Brett to build opportunities uh, to dialogue and exchange of experiences to promote technical innovations. This uh, series of uh, technical exchange cycles aims at promoting cooperation and the exchange of experiences using as a reference the pillars of the global plan of action of the decade, and also the priorities outlined in Latin America and the Caribbean in the Charter of uh, Santiago de Chile in 2022. Thus, this space will be used to share lessons learned and challenges faced in the development of family farming registries uh, and uh, they're linked with uh, policies to strengthen the sector around the world. First edition was uh, held for the first time during 2023 around the topic of family farming records, and, and which is available in our, on our website where you can also access the recordings of this uh, second cycle of exchange. For the second edition, we want to discuss uh, a key aspect related to the strengthening of family farming, facilitating access to markets that value not only their production, but also their cultural strength uh, and the diversity of their products, which is critical in the different strategies for development and inclusive rural transformation. Likewise, Access to markets must be linked to family farmers' access to infrastructure, technology, information, and communication systems and innovations adapted to enhance their productive capacity. One of the main mechanisms for making this connection is public procurement through programs and policies of direct procurement from family farmers and their organizations States and public entities gain access to healthy, nutritious, safe, and culturally appropriate food while ensuring fair and equitable conditions for producers. So we want to share experiences that will be discussions and reflections on what are the main challenges encountered and linking the production of family farming in public procurement mechanisms and discuss examples of solutions and tools that have been developed. For this edition, we've built a methodological proposal with our technical team from the Food and Nutrition Division, the ESN, at our headquarters, as well as uh, our colleagues from uh, PSUF and uh, with a local team uh, le led by Pedro Boareto. Importantly, the second uh, edition of the exchange cycle is also part of the process leading up to the mid-term uh, forum of the United Nations Decade for fam uh, Family Farming in 2019-2028, which will take place in October 2024 at the uh, 
Rome headquarters. In doing so, they will contribute to enhance the critical debate throughout this year on the policy innovations needed to support family farming today and in the future. The outcomes of the sessions will be presented in the, the UNDFF Midterm Forum and will contribute to the identification of priority policy and technical areas that will shape the UNFF's agenda in the coming years. Uh, to welcome us, uh, we first uh, have uh, our colleague, uh, Maya Takaji. She's the regional program leader, FAO Office for Latin America and the Caribbean. Maya, you have uh, the floor. Thank you, Luis, and thank you for all those uh, in the session. On behalf of FIU, I'd like to thank our speakers and our colleagues. I would like to uh, emphasize the idea of this regional technical platform. I mean, this activity as part of the context of uh, the five regional technical platforms where uh, for our region we selected family farming. And uh, as part of this uh, link with the knowledge platform on family farming platform led by PSU, and for us it's a great opportunity to uh, discuss this topic, which is known throughout the regions, but in our region uh, is um, even uh, more important because we know that 80 percent, at least 80 percent, depending on the country, of course, they, they rely on, on, on uh, family farming. Uh, and uh, family farming as a uh, huge development uh, to face uh, challenges related to climate change, climate variability, access to services, uh, access to natural resources, uh, land, water. Uh, soil, which is uh, being degraded, as uh, we just uh, had our regional conference, where we dealt uh, this uh, family farming. There's a strong demand from from countries, from ministers, to strengthening the access to services, policies, uh, access to financial services, uh, technical assistance, and natural resources. With uh, with a focus, uh, with a differentiated focus, uh, uh, looking at inclusion, these policies have to be inc inclusive for family farmers, inclusive from the point of view of gender, strengthening the participation of uh, women, the youth. That's uh, always a big challenge, including uh, young women and the various ethnicities, indigenous populations, Afro descendants, which are, which in our region are the most vulnerable. Public procurement, which is part of this first uh, cycle, are already a uh, tested, uh, proven tool. I believe quite strongly here in the region. Therefore, I, I will, let me commend you for selecting this topic as the first uh, seminar for this new cycle of 2024. Once again, I'd like to thank uh, Nancy uh, and uh, Guilherme for, the, for their participation and our colleagues uh, in the session. Uh, between today and June, uh, remember that these these processes of knowledge exchanges are at the core of what we are as FAO in terms of uh, capacity building. We don't want them to be just uh, seminars. These are opportunities to exchange, to share knowledge, sharing of experiences, and uh, 
learn all the lessons uh, from all the main challenges for implementing these policies and initiatives so that we can so that uh, we can have uh, more and better policies on family farming. So thank you once again. And uh, back to you, Luis. Muchas gracias, Maya, por tus palabras. A continuación, inmediatamente doy la palabra a nuestro colega, amigo Guilherme Brady. Guilherme es el jefe de la Unidad de Agricultura Familiar, Redes Parlamentarias y Comunicación para el Desarrollo de la FAO que viene apoyando la construcción e implementación de las actividades de nuestra plataforma técnica of our activities of our regional platform. Um, Guillermo also heads uh, the contribution of the FAO in uh, the implementation of the decade of uh, family agriculture. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your support, for your joint uh, work. I believe that we have a very beautiful example here of collaboration and of work at uh, different levels of the FAO and at the level of different uh, units of the FAO supporting the family farming system. I would just like to highlight or supplement uh, a couple of things that both uh, Luis and Maya have already mentioned uh, for the wider ranging audience uh, that is with us here today. And I refer to the effort of uh, establishing platforms uh, for the for, the, for exchanges and for knowledge within family farming is indeed a very important step. I believe that it is truly a great support for the implementation of this decade, the creation of this regional platform uh, to exchange ideas on uh, family farming in uh, by the Office of Latin America and the Caribbean and uh, linking up that platform with the other global uh, entities that we have the platform to acknowledge uh, family farming and the initiatives of the communication initiatives for development. We, cre we have created an institutional ecosystem that is very robust and that uh, provides us with uh, tremendous content uh, information and that enables us uh, to view this issue and uh, the scope of it and to reach other stakeholders. And uh, we'll, that includes uh, the communications uh, for communication for the development that we have in Latin America, uh, CASA in Africa, and uh, the uh, Asian uh, counterpart uh, to deal with this issue of family farming in agricultural areas uh, based on uh, rural radio stations and other means of communication. So I thank you enormously and all this forms part of a process of a an experience that we have had during this uh, year uh, to reach the midterm entity in the implementation of the decade that will be held between the 15th and 17th of October during the World Food Forum in Rome. So I certainly invite you all to, uh, to participate in that activity that will be held in October. And we're also organizing a whole series of activities practically every month uh, that uh, all add to our experiences and to our knowledge related to different issues linked to family farming. We are holding activities that have to do with reflections around the major issues uh, that are being discussed presently about the future of family farming, the integration of the environmental agenda in uh, family farming policies, and also a whole series of activities uh, that imply technical exchanges uh, within the framework of uh, that seminar, of that joint activity with uh, the regional platform and also training activities in and public policies for family farming and also training around other issues of interest. I would like to highlight uh, why we have selected uh, uh, public uh, procurement uh, when it comes to family farming and especially uh, um, school meals programs. Uh, I believe that there is a tremendous need for innovation when it comes to public policies for family farming. We are living within a context of challenges uh, that go uh, beyond uh, uh, or that encompass different uh, public policy areas and that uh, demand a better integration of actions, a better planning of actions. And uh, I believe that uh, public procurement uh, policies when it comes to family farming have has been one of the main innovations in the field of public policies over the past few years. 
they have integrated uh, uh, farming, health, uh, nutritional policies with uh, educational policies as well. And that all enables us uh, to effectively seek out a better coordination between different areas within governments. And also, we detect uh, many benefits uh, as from the viewpoint of the national states uh, that enables us to optimize resources, be much more effective in the provision uh, to combine operational capabilities, uh, resource, uh, different resources, both human and financial resources, and also to maximize uh, results, um, accumulating benefits in various uh, areas of uh, public policies. And that is indeed that type of uh, innovation that go beyond agricultural policies themselves uh, that we are trying uh, to think about and uh, to seek how different uh, public policy mechanisms may be used in order to support uh, family agri uh, family farming. And I believe that, that there is tremendous scope here for discussions and for reflections. As uh, uh, mentioned by Bedushi, that is indeed very important because in accordance with the data of the World Food Program, we have 418 million uh, boys and girls uh, throughout the world that uh, require uh, food. Uh, and here we find a tremendous opportunity and via public procurement uh, it, uh, for family farming, we can support uh, not only the access uh, to nutritious and uh, uh, healthy um, food for children, but initiatives that help us uh, to establish uh, food systems uh, that are much uh, closer, uh, so to speak, uh, to population are decentralized and also uh, promoting local economies. And uh, we are working along those lines and we will continue to work on that, but we are aware that there are indeed many challenges when it comes uh, to purchasing uh, family farming products. Uh, it is not easy. There is a need to structure production, to organize production, to seek out uh, payment mechanisms. So there are a whole series of challenges and we want to hear uh, from countries uh, that are promoting these types of initiatives, how they are finding solutions uh, to that and alternatives to that, uh, to those types of uh, aspects. So we thank you enormously for your interest, uh, for the participation of panelists, and we hope to uh, welcome you all in uh, October in the midterm event uh, for the Decade Initiative. Thank you, Guillermo. As you saw, uh, both Guillermo and Maya have uh, facilitated, uh, have made my work easier, so I don't have to spend a lot of time justifying why uh, this link uh, between uh, public procurement uh, of family farming products uh, is uh, so that and and its link with school meals is so important. I would like to tell you that in order to work around that issue, we have colleagues here from the FAO, technical officers of the FAO. We also have representatives of the Coalition for School Meals, uh, the Consortium on uh, School Meals and Nutrition, uh, representatives of the Government of Brazil, and also representatives of the Organization of uh, uh, Family Farming Producers of uh, Burundi. After these presentations, we will have uh, uh, the possibility a 30 or 40 minute period uh, for a Q&A session so that we can discuss in greater depth the cases that have been presented. And for this uh, purpose, we invite you to take note of all the queries that you may want to make uh, to our presenters. After that, we will open up the floor to hold an open debate on the relevance and the and the challenges that exist when it comes to the development of an institutional framework for the purchasing of family farming products and within the framework of the school meals programs. Now, in view of time, I would like to offer uh, presenters uh, to abide by the time that they have been allocated, and I will certainly be warning you, be warning you that you are running out of time for your presentation. I would now like to offer the floor to the presentation of my colleague Nancy Aburto. Nancy, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Nancy is the acting director of uh, the nutrition and food unit of the FAO. Nancy, you have 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you, Luis, and thank you for the invitation. I'll be making my presentation in English, so if you need interpretation, uh, please uh, 
you can uh, click on the language of your preference to be here today and uh, the main reason I'm pleased to be here is actually wrapped up in the title of my presentation, which is Sustainable Public Food Procurement, Multiple Benefits to a Multiplicity of Beneficiaries. And that really uh, is the reason that I'm inspired by the efforts around sustainable public food procurement and the integration of family farming, local farmers and local um, actors in what is sustainable public food procurement. The reason for this is that we recognize that we are not advancing towards our global goals for sustainable development of Agenda 2030 nearly fast enough. So we have got to really be concentrating on those efforts that can help us achieve multiple goals simultaneously. And public food procurement is widely recognized as one of these strategic policy instruments that can indeed help us achieve multiple development goals. Now, this is based on a recognition that public institutions, when they use their financial capacity and their purchasing power to award contracts, they can really go far beyond the immediate scope of responding just to procurement needs. They can also address uh, social, environmental, and economic needs. And when I say social needs, I include in that nutrition and health needs. And this, of course, can contribute to the overall public good. So sustainable public food procurement is recognized within these sustainable development goals, very specifically in target 12.7, that promotes public procurement practices that are sustainable, in accordance with national policy and priorities. And then building out from this and aligned with this, there are various regional frameworks that have also included the recognition of the potential power for sustainable public procurement and public food procurement. Uh, this also is very recently been highlighted in the United Nations Food System Summit of 2021 and then echoed again at the two-year follow-up in 2023 that public food procurement can be a game changer, a key concrete action that can transform our food systems for both healthy people and healthy planet. So, of course, different, there are different types of public institutions that can support this process. And we've got prisons, hospitals, um, universities, even our, our armies and uh, social programs. And we think a lot in the scope of social programs as those uh, school programs. And one reason there's a lot of focus here, it makes a lot of sense, is that school food procurement uh, of course, can help provide a predictable and a stable demand through its school food and nutrition initiatives. And this can help support the needs of family farmers for that stable um, market. But it also specifically benefits children. And children are indeed a beneficiary group that really is supportive of multi-sectorial action because we all wanna be supportive of the next generation. We all want to be supportive of children. And it's not just the programs that are occurring today, it's when those school programs are partnered with robust school food and nutrition education that we can really help instill in children lifetime dietary behaviors that can contribute to future demand for sustainable public food procurement for healthy diets. So we can have an impact today and into the future. Now, key characteristics of food procurement initiatives can impact across different components of, of food systems and affect a range of actors. And this is what we're talking about in that title of having a multiplicity of beneficiaries. But it really depends on the choices that we make around some key questions. The key questions being what food is being purchased, 
from whom are we purchasing this food? And from what type of production practices are we prioritizing in our purchasing behavior? Public food procurement can influence food consumption and food production patterns, again, to deliver those multiple social, economic, and environmental beneficiaries. We can create demand for certain types of food and for certain types of production practices if we are deliberate in the way that we answer these three questions. So diving into each one of those questions, what food is being purchased? Now, if we are purchasing healthy, nutritious, safe, and culturally appropriate food in public food procurement initiatives, we can influence an increase in the variety and quantity of nutritious foods served in public venues, in public spaces. But we're also promoting the value of local dietary habits and traditional nutritious foods. And when we link this to that second question of the choice of from whom we're purchasing, we are also influencing the family farmers themselves to be producing nutritious foods and diversified crops, which could potentially benefit their consumption patterns and could potentially benefit the availability of more diversified foods in local markets for the entire community. So indeed, in this way, the public food procurement initiatives have potential to directly impact food consumption, dietary diversity, and nutrition status across a whole array of actors. Now, if we go back to that second question, from whom should these public purchases be made? If we make that decision to engage with the family farmers, engage with vulnerable producers, especially women and youth, as was mentioned by Maya earlier, these public food procurement initiatives can become an instrument to support local and family farming production and stimulate that economic development. It can encourage, it can facilitate, and it can reduce the risk of investment to farmers to increase and diversify their agricultural production. It can also benefit uh, micro, small, medium enterprises across the entire food value chain. And of course, that focus on youth, that focus on gender can help contribute to empowering those groups and leading to greater social equity. So the final question, from what type of production practices are we focusing our public food procurement initiatives? If we target these on foods that are produced in a specific way that can ensure environmental sustainability and promote biodiversity, we can have that impact on that additional pillar of, of uh, sustainable development, the environmental pillar. We can do things like purchasing food that are based on low impact production methods, things like um, agroecological methods, um, organic methods, et cetera. So public food procurement can hold that potential to promote those environmental benefits. Um, and this can also have um, other effects beyond just the production. It's also focusing on things like fresh and minimally processed foods that can reduce packaging, um, having shorter value chains that can reduce food loss and waste, and also reduce those food miles. So if we are deliberate in responding to those three questions, we, uh, I, I think um, we can all agree that there is tremendous potential in sustainable public food procurement. However, despite this great potential, to implement these initiatives, it's, it's not so simple, it's not so straightforward. And I think Guillermo mentioned some of, um, or alluded to some of those challenges. But uh, at FAO in the, in the Food and Nutrition Division, we've, we've collected and learned a great deal from the work that we've been doing in this area um, for quite some time. And one thing that we recognize is that you have to have coordinated efforts, coordinated conditions across the supply side, the demand side, and linking that to policy 
and institutions. And so today's workshop, I think, is really a great opportunity to be discussing some of these conditions and how we can enable the correct conditions to make this complex milieu of, of, uh, of actors and situations work for sustainable public food procurement for all pillars of sustainable development. Um, before I pass back the microphone where we'll be able to, to dive a little bit deeper, I want to highlight a few things that we have learned from um, our division in this regard. So starting just with the supply side, we know that there are a lot of bottlenecks and challenges, constraints that family farmers have to engaging in public food procurement. Some of those are shown here on the slide. And we, again, have to be very deliberate about working to overcome these challenges. We actually indeed have some uh, rather disappointing or, or somewhat disappointing um, information that we gathered from some impact evaluations done in Zambia and Ethiopia that showed in homegrown school feeding initiatives if we weren't deliberate in thinking about these constraints, that we could actually have detrimental effects on smallholder farmers. Um, so there's great potential there, but we have to be very thoughtful about how we approach it. Now, looking at the, the demand side, some of the barriers that we've uh, run into that we've come across are things linked to adequate funds, um, ad adapted inclusive procurement procedures and practices, which can also oftentimes be a bottleneck, especially um, for implementation of these types of efforts, and local institutional capacities that need to be increased so that these programs for sustainable public food procurement can be successfully implemented. And that takes us to the last uh, sort of set of um, concerns to consider, and that's the policy, the institutional, and the legal frameworks. We really need to promote multi-sectorial action, a multi-sectorial and interministerial approach to these types of initiatives, and we need to support a set of national policies. So it's not just one policy because we've got these interministerial collaborations to consider, so it oftentimes takes a set of policies that need to be aligned and aligned also with legal frameworks. So FAO, together with our partners, and I really want to highlight that part of, of the equation as well, the, the way that we as FAO have really been able to um, work with partners as a complete necessity for, for any of our efforts in this regard, we are engaged in supporting uh, the implementation of effective sustainable public food procurement in a lot of different ways. And a lot of it is specifically to try to overcome some of those barriers that I just highlighted. Now at the global level, we work to produce global public goods, um, such as a, a recent publication on public food procurement for sustainable food systems and healthy diets. Uh, we also uh, are working on designing guidelines, helping to support guidance, and also convening. So convening um, experts, convening like what we're doing today for an exchange of ideas, information, lessons, and practices so that we can all learn together for uh, uh, advancing our efforts in this regard. Uh, we also are working with regions. Um, of course, I'm at headquarters, but we work across all of all of the regions. You can see here on this map just a few of the places where we're working with regions and with governments in individual countries to support sustainable public, public food procurement initiatives, in particular with a great deal of emphasis on those school food and nutrition and school feeding programs that engage in sustainable public food procurement. We've been working um, for more than a, a decade to, to support local and national governments to design and implement programs across Africa, Latin America, Asia. Um, and you can see some of the examples on the slide. 
And finally, I just want to reiterate, I've said it once before, but I'll say it again. We don't do any of this work alone, as you all know. In addition to a very strong partnership that we have with WFP, EFAD, UNEP, and other UN agencies, we also have lots of bilateral partnerships that we engage in to help support this work, bilateral with civil society, with academic institutions, et cetera. We're also engaged in some big and broad partnerships for awareness raising and advocacy in this area. Um, one thing I want to highlight is this interest group on sustainable public food procurement that comes under the sustainable public procurement program of the One Planet Network. We really think that this at the global level is a great opportunity for us to continue our efforts in, in advocacy and awareness raising around the potential of these initiatives. Um, we're also, of course, um, actively engaged in the School Meals Coalition that came out of the UN Food System Summit and very specifically um, supporting within that umbrella the sustainable food, for, per, excuse me, sustainable food procurement for schools. So to conclude, we can reaffirm that public food procurement is an important policy instrument to promote food systems transformation. Again, it's been named a game changer. We can indeed achieve multiple development objectives, multiple sustainable development goals, including sustainable rural development and the support to family farming within these initiatives. Nevertheless, it's not that easy and there's a lot to be done. So coming together to share lessons learned from the long lasting work in this area um, is very, very important. We can build on what we know about the need for a holistic approach and that cross sectorial coordination and synergy, synergies between agriculture, between nutrition, health, education and other sectors. So we, again, FAO and the Food and Nutrition Division, we, with our partners, are committed and engaged to continuing this work, to continue supporting countries, and continue to supporting the broader global community so that we can more effectively implement sustainable public food procurement initiatives so we can drive those sustainable development goals. And with that, I will thank you for your time and I will hand the microphone back over to Luis. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, Ness. Very, very useful presentation. Uh, acá yo, a, a mí me sirvió mucho de this was very useful for me, especially because of that idea that uh, through a single instrument we were able to resolve several policy issues. And here, school meals is one of those examples. We talked about nutrition, education, health, and so on. Uh, and I believe that there is an aspect here that involves a market, uh, the creation of markets. Uh, a market is not an abstract entity that has provided us uh, with a single uh, strategy, but it is the result of a social construction. And Nancy's presentation evidences how we are able to build a market uh, to encourage demand, uh, to link that uh, with the supply. And the third point uh, that uh, I truly love uh, of this work on school meals is how we build uh, and create habits uh, among children, uh, valuing uh, nutrition with uh, real food, as we say in our country. And finally, there is a very important issue issue that we will continue to discuss in greater depth here, and that uh, refers to how we face up to the dilemmas of uh, uh, nutrition, how we overcome the barriers, uh, the bottlenecks uh, that hinder the implementation of these schemes. Obviously, there's no silver bullet. There is a mix of policies that has to be organized in order to make that work. So thank you very much, Nancy. And colleagues, I would like to remind you all that we will have a Q&A session uh, so that we can continue with an open debate uh, later on. So we invite you to uh, ask, uh, to post your questions in the chat uh, or subsequently or later on to ask for the floor, um, raising your hand. Now we would like to invite uh, our colleagues, uh, Samrat Singh, who is president of the practice, uh, the community of practice of uh, 
uh, Nutrition and Diet of the Consortium on uh, the Research of uh, uh, School Meals and Nutrition of the Coalition of School Meals, and also uh, Emily C. Danner, who is coordinator of the Secretariat of the Coalition. Uh, Dr. Singh and Dr. Sinader, you both have 15 minutes for your presentation. I understand that we will be changing the slides as from here, if we are not mistaken. Good, uh, good afternoon, and thank you for accepting to show the slide. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm the coordinator of the School Meals Coalition Secretariat based in Rome. As uh, Nancy just mentioned, it's a multi-stakeholder, multi-country network. And so I'll start by saying a few words about the coalition, and then we'll pass the floor to Dr. Samrat Singh to go into the, the core of the topic of the discussion today. So let me just say that the coalition was launched at the Food System Summit in 2021. This was in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. As you will all remember, schools were massively clo closer around the world that affected both rich and poor communities. And that's when we came to the understanding that schools provide much more than education. They provide essential services, including school feeding. But it was also a time where we realized the potential of school meals to support communities and all these multi-sectoral linkages that uh, Nancy just uh, mentioned. So, a group of countries led by France and Finland uh, put forward the coalition at the Food System Summit as a multi-sectoral initiative that would achieve uh, multi-sectoral goals. And uh, from the beginning, food systems and the issue of links with local procurement, links with family farming were at the very core of the agenda. So perhaps we can move uh, to the next slide, please and uh, said that the coalition can have kept growing. Uh, we are now at 97 countries and three regional uh, bodies. Those are the European Commission, the African Union and ECOWAS in West Africa. And we also have, as you will see in the next slide, uh, a growing number of partners that have joined us. Uh, the last uh, uh, record we had was at 127 partners including uh, FAO and all UN agencies, but perhaps also many of the organizations that are here online today. So I hope we can engage in, in a discussion. Burundi, Brazil are also part of, of the coalition. So very much connected to this discussion. If we can move to the next uh, slide. Something that's really important is that all those countries, all those partners rally behind one shared objective, which is to ensure that every child has the opportunity to receive a healthy, nutritious meal in school by 2030. And as you can say, the objectives were three. The first one was really, as I was saying, we were in the middle of a crisis. So what really dragged attention at the beginning was restoring the school meals programs that existed before the pandemic. That objective has been already achieved. The second objective was about reaching all those many children that had not been reached yet and increasing the efficiency of programs and the funding for programs so that we could reach all the children by 2030. But the third objective, and I think that's where we are connecting to the discussion here today, the third objective is about quality and improving the approach. And that's where the linkages with food systems and the linkages with family farming come up. Uh, as you can see, this idea of quality and efficiency links to healthy food environments, promoting safe nutrition and sustainably produced food. So very much, Nancy, what you were, were mentioning around the SDGs and, and public procurement. And you can see that there's a specific uh, reference to linking to local and seasonal uh, production where appropriate. And that's where homegrown school feeding approaches that are uh, of interest to many, many countries, I'm sure we will hear uh, from that today, uh, was put forward from the very beginning in the agenda. And now I'm, I'm happy to share that a lot of the work and the priorities of go governments are around those uh, homegrown approaches that include links to family farming. Could we go to the next slide, please? 
So here we have a few examples of national commitments. As I was mentioning, this is a network driven by countries, 97 countries today. Out of them, 40 have made formal commitments to the coalition. And as you can see, uh, 31 of them, so three quarters of them, have uh, commitments very specifically linked to supply chain, to market linkages, to fresh food, to nutritious food, and to nutritional guidelines and standards. So we have here, for instance, examples of Armenia, uh, Bangladesh, who is changing uh, and piloting a new program to look into food baskets uh, that uh, include fresh food, eggs, bones, locally sourced. France has a specific law also that uh, um, requires to procure food uh, meeting specific quality standards and including organic farming. We have Gambia that has also a very strong accent on homegrown school feeding and I could keep going on. We will hear from Burundi also who has very clear targets along these lines. Kenya has been a champion of uh, homegrown school feeding for, for many years as well. Can we go to the next? A slide, please. Um, a few words on how the coalition works. The coalition is led by a group of 13 countries, led by France, uh, Finland, and since October uh, last year, Brazil, who, uh, as you know, has always been a champion of uh, links between school feeding and local uh, sourcing from family farming. So we will hear, I think, from, from them right now. There's a working group that comprises the 97 countries and the three regional bodies of the coalition. And then the partners group where all the partners of the coalition can join. And all this network is facilitated by a secretariat that I'm pleased to moderate. And that's here really to support the membership of, of the coalition. Importantly, we work through four initiatives that also reflect main bottlenecks that had been identified in moving forward the school feeding agenda and ensuring every child has a school meal at school. The first one is the research consortium, which as you will hear very shortly from Dr. Samran, focusing on generating the evidence for uh, school health and nutrition and, and school feeding in particular. We have an initiative focused on financing and helping countries to develop sustainable financing uh, strategies, an initiative focused on data and monitoring that WFP leads, and finally a new initiative that was launched uh, last year in Paris as well, which is Cities Feeding the Future, and which is about connecting the local governments and the municipalities to uh, the school feeding programs. And I think that's particularly relevant for Latin America, where I understand uh, cities and municipalities in many, many countries are really in charge of implementing the programs and doing the procurement. So if I do a quick deep dive on the research consortium, and that will be my last slide, if we can move through it, the research consortium is hosted by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and works through six community of practices, which you can see in this screen. I won't get into all of them, but there's one specifically working on diet and food systems that look at uh, issues uh, such as homegrown school feeding, family farming, and sustainable programs uh, or planet-friendly programs, if you will. This is led by Dr. Samrat Steele, and that's a way to introduce my colleague and pass him the floor to go into the substance of the topic. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, if you could please share the slides. So I think I'll just start. Uh, so my name is uh, Samrat Singh, and uh, it's great to be part of this very webinar on a very relevant and important topic. Uh, over the next few minutes, I'm going to be speaking about connecting family farms and school feeding, uh, and how really family farms and school feedings are mutually enabling, and together they can really contribute to creating uh, ecolog ecological sustainability and uh, also contribute to planetary health, as the title suggests. Just to give a very quick structure, it's divided, my slides are divided into four sections. I just begin with 
an overview of the scale of school feeding. And then I'll go into the heart of the matter, which is around the linkages between family farming and school feeding, closing with some sense of the trade-offs, constraints, and drivers. If we can move to the next slide, please. So yeah, this is just to give you a very quick sense of the reach and scale of school feeding. So as we can see that, you know, even in Latin America and the Caribbean, 78 million children are receive school meals. And these are pre-COVID figures because that's the most sort of recent data we have. Uh, and overall, of course, you know, the scale of school feeding is 388 million children, and it's increasing and it's poised to increase over the next two, three years to a, high, to a much more significant level. Next slide, please. Very interesting description because it really gives a sense of the rapid increase in the scale and investment in school feeding program. So as we can see that in lower and middle income countries, uh, the school feeding program over a short period of seven years, uh, the number of children receiving school feeding has increased by 86%. Uh, and even in low income countries, it's a very significant increase of 36%. Next slide, please. The value of school feeding budgets, which are sourced from funding, so, you know, overall 90% of the funding comes from domestic budgets. This is critical because then governments are able to drive the mechanisms of procurement and other uh, school feeding and food system linkages because the budgetary uh, tools are within government systems rather than externally funded and tied. And as we can see that... Uh, in lower and middle income, middle income countries, as of 2020, almost 96% of the country's uh, school feeding budgets are funded by the governments themselves. And as I said, this is a very important aspect of driving food system linkages and food, uh, with food systems. Next slide, please. So here I would just spend some time on the slide. This is to demonstrate and give a sense. Of course, it's not comprehensive, but this is to demonstrate how school feeding and food system and uh, family farms can contribute to planetary and uh, human health. So school feeding through these five characters, through these five com components, we can, which you can see four components, starting with procurement and output support. We have heard about this, about how procurement and output support through structured demand. Democratization is the fact that the school feeding itself, the, the sites of school feeding is at, are the schools and there's a lot of community participation and which really implies that a lot of social hierarchies around food are dismantled in terms of dietary practices, in terms of production practices. Then there's the issue of behavior change. And of course, there's a very critical issue of food sovereignty. And there is there, there has been recent literature to demonstrate how home cooked school feeding can enable food sovereignty which is, of course, you know, as we all know, originated in the South America in the 1980s and now is an integral part of the food system dialogue. And also it is part of national laws in many countries. I think over 15 countries have food sovereignty in their national laws. These four components really can lead to a set of outcomes. And I've just mentioned a few outcomes here. I'll very quickly go through them. One is, of course, gender equity. And the gender equity is enabled through the fact that direct linkages with women cooperatives or even through specific commodities, for example, certain foods are grown particularly by women and which are included in school feeding food baskets, legumes, lentils, etc. Then there's the issue of food heritage and culture, given that many of the school feeding menus are designed locally in local participatory workshops with a specific emphasis on making dishes which are traditionally uh, using traditional recipes. Uh, and that also increases the Issue also increases food acceptability and has the potential to lower food waste. Uh, this in also this can also include traditionally fermented and preserved foods. The next issue relates to indigenous knowledge. This is indigenous knowledge both around production practices and also around practices of cooking, which I have mentioned. The fourth aspect is around climate resilience and adaptation, and this operates to two through two pathways. One is of course through specific commodities which are included in the school feeding basket. There are a few examples uh, in the next slide. Uh, and the other pathway is through specific procurement mechanisms which promote uh, you know, climate smart uh, agricultural practices and family farms. And of course, the obvious one is food and nutrition security as most school feeding menus have a target of uh, 30 to 40% RDA for most micro and micro, uh, micronutrients. And with a specific focus on micronutrient rich foods, especially around zinc, iron, uh, vitamin A, etc. And 
together these linkages can reinforce each other uh, and really have the potential, as I went, as I said earlier, to create healthy and sustainable food systems. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, just some very quick examples given that we are running out of time. So I had mentioned about women. Uh, these are just evidence and examples on two aspects. One is around women empowerment, which is based on specific foods, examples like humes, fruits, vegetables, which are specifically included in school feeding menus. And uh, we know that in many countries, you know, these are primarily grown by women farmers. Uh, and school feeding programs also have explicit engagements with Women cooperatives, there are some examples from Nepal, there are some examples from Tunisia, there are examples from many other countries where women co cooperatives have forward contracts with schools uh, to supply these local fruits and vegetables. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd already mentioned about climate change resilience. This is just to give a quick example. I will just give the example of millet here, which is, of course, as we all know, uh, it's, it's highly nutritious. It has a very low carbon footprint, and it is introduced in school meals in some states in India, where they're primarily grown by subsistence family farmers. So this addresses multiple issues around subsistence agriculture, family farms, nutrition, and also uh, climate smart agriculture practices. Uh, next slide, please. Slide just to give a sense of the policy engagement of school feed. I realize I'm running out of time. So what I'm going to do is uh, these are the pillars which are most relevant for school feeding from the global action plan of the family farming uh, decade. And each of these pillars really relates to how school feeding can impact policy engagement. I'll give you a very quick example for pillar three. The role of school feeding in many countries really highlights uh, the role of women in production and consumption. And uh, this in turn can, and has in certain cases, the evidence to show uh, increased policy engagement with you know, uh, agriculture policies related to empowerment of women, access to credit specifically in relation to women, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll sort of close with this slide. Uh, here are the, you know, just to give you a flavor of some of the constraints and trade-offs, because there are a number of constraints and trade-offs. In terms of the scale, of course, school feeding can enable these changes at a very large scale, given that many of the school feeding programs are universal and many of them actually operate all year round. Uh, and so, but this, so the scale can be very significant. And it can be very context specific because of the nature of food systems and the nature of local procurement. The drivers are, as some of this have been mentioned in the earlier presentations, around policy, integrity, institutional frameworks. So I'm not going to go into this. One of the key trade, I'm going to go to the last bullet point, which is around the trade-offs, which is the transfer of transaction costs to school feeding budgets. So in the absence of allied frameworks, for example, in the, access of, in the absence of access to credit, in the absence of capacities related to agricultural extension, uh, a deliberate engagement with family farms can at times run the risk of transferring the transaction costs to school feeding budgets, which are as disconstrained. Uh, and next slide, please. So, yeah, I think, you know, I've uh, run out of time now. So I'll just conclude by saying that, uh, you know, school feeding, the interaction between school feeding and family farming has a great potential uh, to achieve food system transformation. But a lot of work needs to be done around these issues, which is being done. And I uh, look for and we all look forward to seeing how it translates in the coming years. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity of speaking. Yeah. Thank you so much, colleagues. Dr. Sinadar, Dr. Singh. Uh, muy interesante de ver really interesting to see the scope of this agreement, this consensus around the importance of family farming. Uh, the call, up to the resulting coalitions are from the Food Systems Summit. This is just one probably the most robust uh, with a multiplicity of actors with a wide uh, uh, geographic uh, range. So so I, I believe there's a very good platform to move forward. And it's also important to see how, especially in the last few slides, Dr. Singh 
this constrains the trade-offs uh, that we'll have to face to move this agenda forward. But before we go into the next presentation, I would like to suggest speakers that you can look at the chat box and uh, the Q&A section, and maybe you can address the comments or questions that the 124 participants are making as you uh, were presenting. Anyway, to connect those uh, thoughts to specific cases uh, at different levels, I have the pleasure to have here Lydia Hao. She's the National Secretary of Food Security and Nutrition from the Ministry of Social Development from Brazil. The Brazilian experience, I'd like to thank uh, them. Uh, it's really important. Uh, school meals are just, uh, just a tool among many that are part of a strategy of promoting uh, food security and uh, nutrition. And the wager for on uh, family farming as a food supplier, it's a political decision as part of a much wider strategy and the discussion of the, the, the development model. So no better person that a Lillian to share that uh, view from the Ministry of Social Development from the Brazilian government. Lillian, you have 15 to 20 minutes for your presentation. For yours. Uh, we cannot hear you, Lydia. I guess you are working on the audio. I see your microphone is on, yet we cannot hear you. Uh, maybe. How about now? Okay, now it's working. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I, I was, I will speak in Portuguese as we, the translation, and it's easier for it's, me. It, A única coisa ali é tenta falar bem forte e perto do microfone para que o serviço de interpretação possa try to speak into a microphone so that we can have our translation service work. Let me share my presentation. Pedro also has a copy of it in case it doesn't work. Pronto. Falta só colocar em modo apresentação ou leitura. It's okay. Just uh, go to uh, presentation mode, please. Pronto. Posso passar? Está chegando. Ok. Bora. Next uh, slide, please. Ok. Muito obrigada, uh, Luiz, What great. Maia, Thank you, Luiz, Maia, and the other FAO colleagues uh, from your invitation. I'd like to talk about the history of uh, public procurement programs here in Brazil. For about a year, it was uh, 2023, where we first implemented uh, the public procurement program from family farming at the federal level in Brazil, which is the food procurement uh, program which was a decisive action from the federal government to implement various uh, public procurement programs from uh, family farming, even public procurement for the national uh, school meals uh, program. I believe the previous presentations were made a made emphasis on, on food uh, on school meals or, or school feeding, especially the the benefits of a local procurement, and that for us in Brazil it's not different. 
the decision of uh, starting a family farming procurement program provided the possibility to create this uh, school feeding program as well as uh, multiple local municipal programs to uh, which uh, was really important we started the program in 2003 uh, so that we could leverage some of the existing policies of family farming which required uh, to be strengthened before I explained the program of uh, procurement uh, program and everything it involves and everything that happened after the implementation. I believe it's important to say that by mid 1990s in Brazil, we started with a series of uh, programs to promote family farming, specifically a rural credit program for uh, family farming, to strengthen family farming. And from this implementation, from these programs, rural credit, rural loan for family farming, we managed to develop from zero hunger approach, a series of actions and programs that may offer promotion of family farming, but also make a progress in terms of uh, find the actions for family farming and uh, fight against hunger and a healthy diet. We were lucky enough that uh, early on, we were able to create a public procurement program from family farming and also allowed us to understand that there is a there is not a single program addressing everything. We needed a set of actions to promote uh, production, technical assistance, uh, uh, credit uh, access, uh, supply policies that will allow us to properly implement a public procurement program from family farming and using public procurement even in some specific programs, such as the case of uh, school meals or other programs, such as uh, uh, armed forces, uh, uh, public spaces, and other programs which have been used, uh, which have been covered by these uh, public procurement. Lillian, you're not in the presentation mode yet. Could you please expand? We, oh, maybe Pedro can do that. Uh, I, it, it is in the presentation mode for me, Luis. I will ask Pedro. Maybe he can do that. Pedro, that's the second email I just sent. I will... I let me stop sharing so that you can go to the presentation mode. Pedro can do that. Okay, Pedro, you go to the presentation mode. There it is. I've already talked about this. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Next. As I said, in Brazil, we have a, a public procurement program in family farming, which was established uh, in 2003 as part of a zero hunger program in order to have uh, a, uh, a way to fight the hunger for the whole country and from the food procurement from family farming. That's a uh, program strengthening family farming and uh, um, promotes access to food for the whole country. This program, as I said, was uh, 
the origin, what's the starting point of all this sequence of public uh, procurement we have uh, since then. This is a uh, this is an active program, uh, very important for the food security of the country. That's uh, 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 from the very beginning. Uh, We've been buying from family farmers and uses public uh, budget at the federal level to buy products from family farmers. Those food are donated and then to people, uh, the vulnerable people in terms of uh, food, uh, to also to our assistance uh, network. The network uh, of uh, food security, uh, solidarity, kitchens, and our public uh, health care, education, and justice uh, network. So we have a, a bid to buy from uh, family farmers, provided our prices are competitive uh, to uh, uh, regional uh, grocery stores. We have here multiple ways to operate, but most important is uh, purchase with a simultaneous donation, the purchase of, about, I mean, buying from family farmers. We also work with the procure uh, purchase and donation of uh, dairy products, especially in arid places in Brazil, where we want to promote the use of uh, milk as well as we offer as well as offering milk to the to vulnerable population. We also have uh, other forms, such as uh, institutional procurement, which is a way to use budgets from other programs other than uh, food and uh, buying from uh, family farming. Next uh, slide, Pedro, please. We've uh, conducted several studies uh, throughout the years. We have collected information as to programs. And today we have, uh, we know that uh, these program uh, helps uh, several families, which as uh, th these families are, uh, uh, they're all farmers and they have uh, minimum wage, minimum monthly wage, which doubles uh, the income of a family. And that, uh, that has been a, a very important uh, opportunity for the marketing and reaching private markets. We also managed to have uh, over 50% uh, over 50 allocation of these programs to small municipalities and middle-sized municipalities, between 10 and 50,000 inhabitants. And it works. It works as a, as, as a, as a, as a, as a way to strengthen local, local markets in a local environment. And also pr promotes uh, production of uh, food and access to them. It uh, fights all food deficiency and improves nutritional conditions. It increases the, the, the revenues and income of uh, family farmers and helps reducing all rural problems. Now, let me make a point here. We have uh, several organizations supporting uh, family farmers, the, the most vulnerable family farmers. We don't have a registry. We have a unique registry that that um, 
with over 100 million people in it. And there we apply the Bolsa Familia program, but also allows to identify poor people and families. And uh, we have another registry, which is the survey of uh, structural family with over 3 million families in it. This is a survey that identifies family farming that uh, may offer products to public procurement. And through those uh, administrative registries or records, we can uh, we can identify of family farmers, the poor family farmers, which require more benefit, as well as as well as other other traditional communities such as indigenous peoples, the you know, quilombolas and others that do not have access to programs and that for that reason need to be identified. So with this program, we want to reach uh, poor sectors and those areas that can cannot um, gain access to healthy diets through family farming. So these uh, families needs to be strengthened. Uh, producers should strengthen their production, production of uh, food. With these programs, we manage to have a positive impact on the GDP of municipalities. Next slide, please. This program, after 20 years, is still innovative because of um, because of multiple reasons, but mainly because of these, the civil society engagement, social uh, social organizations. And how, from the very beginning, 20 years ago, it works on the, on the social dimension with the National Board of Food Security and Nutrition, and uh, it's still important to strengthen family farming, access to food, and vulnerable people and it contributes to strengthening the strengthening of uh, municipal economies and it collaborates the, the regional uh, development uh, uh, particularly in the north the uh, east region which is a which is a uh, region with the uh, highest number of family farmers, uh, poor, many of them, and uh, with a great importance on. This is important to uh, open opportunities for other public procurement programs. Uh, we use a food procurement program as an opportunity for families to experience uh, public uh, procurement and get ready to offer food to our national school meals program. Besides uh, the types of private market and other public procurements from family farming we've uh, worked on over time. Last, since last year, we have had uh, major changes in the program, food procurement, now, people can react and can uh, face our challenges in terms of uh, our in terms of our implementation and these new challenges Brazil is facing. That is reducing food insecurity, reduce the hunger. These are also program where uh, uh, food procurement uh, are part of it so as to centralize public uh, procurement and the public budget to focus that on on uh, quilombolas indigenous populations traditional populations 
and uh, family farmers, the agricultural reform, the youth, the young women, colored people overall, uh, to reach that audience with Tara, the most vulnerable people with the access difficulties to the public sector. We have um, programs to reach indigenous populations for them to gain access to uh, the multiple programs and to make them flexible in terms of the documents they have to submit, I mean, to make their life easier by uh, by by having a single roster, a single list, uh, a single registry, so that they can be part of uh, projects and uh, bits to um, the pop or uh, food procurement. After 20 years, though, we have managed to implement the need that 20% of all the pro federal procurement in Brazil are to be made uh, from uh, of family farming, and in 2009-2010, we submitted the uh, purchasing purchasing uh, uh, food uh, food uh, school meals uh, were uh, bought from family farming, and last year there is an uh, there is a law for universities, the armed forces. There is an obligation for them uh, to have a minimum percentage, 60%, should be procured from family farming through the various uh, federal agencies. One of the programs as a comprises Ministry of Social Development, Agricultural Development, the supply uh, national supply organization and uh, among many uh, among other ministries these agencies are putting together the rules and regulations are are leading uh, this food procurement uh, and everything this is done uh, from uh, from uh, family farming. We have the uh, 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 food uh, security program uh, was eliminated uh, until 2022. But we have now a program in place. Uh, we're working uh, with uh, women. Last year, we reached over 60% women. And now we are using the program as an incentive uh, for youth uh, in family farming and uh, retaining uh, in uh, retaining the young people near the near near agriculture. We also have a program to offer equipment to meet the food scarcity in the urban peripheries. In 2023, this uh, food the public procurement program was, uh, this was a, we bought 1 billion reals, which uh, 81,707 uh, family farmers, 61% women, we bought over 163,000 pounds of food and uh, we distributed to over or nearly 10,000 social assistance uh, organizations. Well, uh, well, the, the school, back to the school feeding uh, program as uh, addressed before, uh, but let me say that the 
procurement of food for uh, school feeding. For that, uh, we've... Uh, we had a greater availability, twice what we initially had, as well as, uh, for, 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 I mean, from for, uh, to buy from uh, family farmers. But we expect to have uh, positive results in the future. These two programs are very important. We we have to create the family farming uh, market, which is uh, really important. Uh, family, uh, I mean, uh, food procurement uh, for school meals, so that the rules we use are the same. We have formal groups or informal groups of family farmers, individuals, cooperatives, the rules are the same. And as I already said early in my presentation, our program, our school meals program established in 2009, we have this obligation of 30% uh, procurement from family farmers uh, for uh, school feeding. So the and uh, this was a, a a strategy because we were able to share this with other countries, and now uh, we managed to build this sort of uh, circuit to promote uh, family farming as one of the mechanisms to promote sustainable and healthy food. Last but not least, in Brazil, uh, last, uh, uh, last March, we enacted a, a new uh, basic food basket based on our experience uh, over the years. Uh, with the family farming, public procurement, and other production programs, um, supply, consumption. With uh, this uh, decree was uh, enacted uh, last uh, March, which sets the uh, guidelines for our actions, programs, and policies for procurement uh, supply and consumption. And for uh, kids uh, under two years of age, this new basket respect uh, diversity of uh, cultures uh, and uh, ethnical diversity is focused on 10 groups of uh, food and those uh, groups are natural with the minimum processing. We excluded ultra-processed uh, food from our basket. Also, with this new decree, we are guiding our programs and, and, and public programs and policies. So we are now eliminating the possibility of uh, buying ultra-processed uh, food for our public programs, and we're diversifying and looking at the conditions and uh, and uh, uh, and fitting uh, uh, behaviors in the different territories and try to consider that in our food basket to respect uh, regional traditions and cultures and have a new parameter or for healthy the diet to promote uh, healthy diets for rural credit procurement as a whole, supply and consumption. And with that, we're trying to start a new agenda for the promotion of healthy 
a diet in Brazil to build additional parameters to promote healthy and sustainable food systems in our country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro, for your support. Muchísimo obrigado. Muchísimas gracias. Lillian, thank you very much. Following a presentation such as this one that is so comprehensive, I dare not uh, make uh, too many comments, but I cannot but uh, uh, leave aside the idea that the food procurement uh, system is a very important uh, innovation in public policies. When one goes uh, into greater depth in the architecture of the program and its different uh, uh, formulas, one finds that flexibility and the adaptation to different realities that is perhaps one of the main strengths of the program. And uh, that continues to be a source of inspiration and uh, of uh, innovation for all of us. Uh, the system, Lillian, of that new basic uh, food basket is, a, again, a, an additional source of inspiration because it guides uh, production, the supply, and uh, the consumption of food. And what is also extremely important is uh, the importance of the participation of civil society and of the accompaniment of the program and that uh, intertwined uh, work uh, between ministries, including the finance ministry, because at the end of the day, that is uh, the ministry that uh, has uh, the money to fund uh, those uh, programs. And so I'm sure, Lillian, that many of the questions that are being asked by our colleagues about that discussion is something that you will be able to um, answer. And I know that uh, even with a very tight agenda, you're always willing to share with us and with other countries. So thank you very much. Now, talking about uh, that uh, strategy of uh, participation and the importance of participation of... Uh, organizations in the various uh, procurement uh, systems. Uh, and that is very important. They provide services to their members, so they help to organize production and also promote uh, social and technological innovations in order to adapt uh, production to the requirements uh, of uh, the demand uh, that uh, exists. Uh, so to deal with that uh, dimension, we now have uh, uh, Mrs. Anik Sesivera, who is Executive Secretary of the Confederation of uh, uh, um, Agricultural Producers uh, Association for uh, Production, Akaji, who accompanies us uh, from Burundi. So please, uh, Anik uh, Sesivera, you have uh, the floor now for your presentation. Hey, bonjour. Hey, je vous remercie pour, uh, Good morning. Pour First of all, I would like to thank you for the opportunity that you have given me to uh, share with you the experiences and the lessons that we have learned uh, in Burundi. As from 2012, uh, when we launched uh, the program, uh, dealing with local procurement and the experience that I would like to share with you refers uh, to local procurement uh, for uh, school uh, meals. So this is a program promoted by the government of Burundi involving the support of its technical and uh, financial partners uh, via the World Food Program. I would like to say that there is a confederation of uh, small family producers uh, that uh, produce uh, crops and uh, part of our cooperatives um, supply uh, school the school meal programs uh, supported uh, by the government uh, through local procurement. We began with a program whereby we conducted uh, centralized uh, procurement uh, via bidding processes. 
Uh, that involved uh, higher or more stringent uh, regulations uh, that uh, considered uh, the conditions of uh, family farming at that time, 10 years ago. But as from the beginning, the government of Burundi established a dialogue in order to exchange uh, viewpoints and in order to listen uh, to our vindications, to our demands. And thus, uh, things uh, uh, sped up uh, as uh, from then because uh, they tested uh, some decentralized uh, procurement programs whereby schools uh, would raise uh, their demands uh, to local uh, farmers. But before we get there, I would like to highlight uh, that uh, family farming uh, represents 90% uh, uh, of uh, employment uh, with a population of around 13.1 million. And today, procurement programs uh, for uh, school meals uh, reach uh, 33% or enables 33% of students uh, to receive a hot uh, meal every day at school. And uh, this uh, 2022 report uh, mentioned uh, that if we look at uh, a 10 year period, uh, 72 cooperatives were able to take part in these programs. So, this enables you to realize that, that we still have a long way to go. And uh, today, the government, uh, well, we must talk about the, the support that we receive as family farmers in order to uh, view the, uh, our participation in public uh, programs. And I would like to highlight the willingness of uh, the present government uh, to support and to continue to expand procurement uh, for school canteens uh, so that we are able to achieve universal coverage for 3 million students approximately, but there are also national policies that have been implemented. And as I said, uh, this has decentralized uh, some uh, direct uh, procurement and has involved uh, local education authorities uh, and uh, the cooperatives. And there is also a rural intermediation whereby uh, family farmers are organized in formal structures uh, such as the agricultural organizations or cooperatives uh, capable of gaining access uh, to these uh, uh, markets uh, that involves uh, the supply of uh, uh, school canteens. There have been many public programs lately, but also many NGO-promoted programs that support uh, the restructuring of uh, uh, family farming in cooperatives, and that also provide technical support. And uh, likewise, uh, support in terms of products and uh, access to loans so that they may improve uh, the quality and quantity of agricultural production and also in order to have uh, more tradable products and also infrastructure uh, for storage purpose and uh, to attach greater value to these products that have all been implemented lately in order to uh, favor the storage uh, and packaging of these uh, products. I would like to mention that uh, the products that are consumed are dry products, easy to store, because uh, schools uh, face uh, uh, difficulties in terms of storage and in terms of water supply for long periods of time, and therefore that involves many logistical problems when it comes to fresh products. But despite all this, I would say today that less than 10% of family farmers participate in these markets. And also taking into consideration the nature of these bidding processes, there are many farmers that are still excluded, uh, primarily because contracts are do not consider the, season, the seasonality of crops, but involve uh, periods that are not uh, most adequate. And often these farmers uh, uh, find it uh, difficult uh, to participate in these types of markets, despite the fact that these are markets uh, that are available to family farmers. There are also demands in terms of other uh, documents uh, that exclude organizations that are not uh, professional and that demand uh, ex uh, evidence of experience and the provision of uh, guarantees uh, 
uh, by small family farmer farming organizations, but we must also seek out uh, economic support, uh, and which involves uh, long waiting periods. It needs, it involves that we, it implies that we have to travel, and that increases the price of our products, but also the size and uh, the amounts, uh, the amounts of products that are provided. By uh, the amounts are, are provided to small cooperatives, and they don't have enough uh, backup uh, to provide. Uh, local markets and today and payment if payment uh, changed uh, from three months uh, from a three month uh, waiting period to a one month uh, payment period uh, that is also very positive and there are also other ways of facilitating the operation of this market for example providing uh, a contract in advance or to establish a contract for each one of the seasons involved. Now, what is it that could facilitate the participation of uh, the farmers in these public markets? Well, first of all, uh, and something that I would like to highlight is to have a, an adequate policy, not a policy that attracts, but rather a policy that supports uh, production in order to improve and strengthen agricultural production, but also in order to improve uh, access conditions and enabling the supply of these products uh, to school canteens. And uh, in terms of procedures, we have to make uh, the direct supply to schools easier by a small uh, amount, establishing a weekly schedule so that small family producers uh, are able to supply school canteens over time. What is also important is that this involves a dialogue because purchasers, be it schools, or the government, or its uh, partners may be able to understand the specificities, specificities of this type of farming. They must be aware of the seasonality uh, of this type of farming and to adapt that to, to what uh, is required. And we must also work in a very, very serious uh, fashion around uh, the issue of the needs of of uh, uh, food, uh, the dry products that do not require water, and at the end of the day, diversify the meals at schools and enter into a dialogue with schools that will also enable uh, a dialogue with uh, different institutions and the provision of other types of products, uh, of other types of nutritious uh, products. So as it, is it that we can introduce beetroot, for example? This is something important for us in Burundi, how to present uh, that food in school camps teens so what are what is uh, the importance of children of uh, being able to eat uh, these types of products at school what is the difference between having a meal at home and having a meal at school what I would also like to highlight is that we must establish quotas because if we don't have established uh, policies if uh, we don't have um, quotas for products that have to be purchased at a local level for this type of market nothing will guarantee the feasibility of this system because we must uh, analyze uh, the decisions that we will that will be made in order to uh, have these quotas in, in place and thus we have to implement uh, mechanisms and uh, monitor indicators uh, to check uh, that these quotas are complied with and that small family farmers are able to supply these quotas as uh, is done by larger producers. So this is a involves the possibility of participating in this market. In the case of my country, there are also some quota participation and market laws that in, contain specificities for family farming. But uh, we must also review how it is uh, that we can improve uh, the administrative uh, procedures uh, and documents that, that are demanded. And we must also improve uh, the demand uh, for water and likewise uh, uh, enable the direct supply and we must establish this dialogue with schools, with school canteens 
And as uh, mentioned uh, by our Brazilian colleague, there are many family farmers uh, that uh, do not have the opportunity of uh, taking part in uh, this procurement. Uh, and we must enable uh, them to participate uh, that this is an opportunity for them that is both possible and feasible. As farmers, we also have uh, our own uh, responsibility in terms of strengthening our capabilities and so that we can adequately organize uh, our supply and uh, determine uh, the market possibilities that exist. Uh, we have a commitment, a commitment vis-a-vis uh, -vis certain practices, uh, certain practices that are sustainable and long-lasting, and uh, we must also be able, capable of protecting our soil and our land uh, with practices that uh, may be adapted uh, to the efforts and to the effects uh, that we encounter today in order to mitigate certain difficulties. We have, have also invested in seeds uh, that are much more adapted and we have diversified our production. Uh, part of which goes to our families and part of which enables uh, or caters for the demand of uh, these uh, school canteen uh, demands. We must participate in training, in information uh, sessions, but we must also work with others. We must adhere or join uh, cooperative uh, cooperatives and uh, peasant organizations so that we're able to diversify our uh, supply. And we must also uh, abide by the specifications in uh, the commitments that we enter into, because many people say that, you, that they do not abide by our commitments, but producers and all, all those participating in the agricultural sector must uh, comply with these commitments so when it comes to prices and other aspects. We must take into consideration the context of volatility that we experience. Uh, there are also agricultural uh, organizations that must support the planning and uh, the management of uh, um, agricultural uh, production. We must uh, ensure access to different types of inputs, uh, the inputs that are required in rural areas. We must support that. We must uh, support access to infrastructure and also access to financing, especially uh, and uh, farming organizations uh, must uh, strengthen traceability, transparency, and estimate uh, uh, profit levels because the pro so that the prices that are fixed are fair prices for both farmers and for schools uh, that uh, purchase these products. And the other point that is also important is that we must ensure uh, the procedures and the market practices as so in order to control that opportunities are useful for all parties. And we must also uh, work uh, so that we may have uh, better conditions adapted uh, to the specificities of the agricultural sector. In Burundi, for example, we work with the support of the FAO. Uh, there is a program uh, for the supply of school canteens that has to be implemented. And there we have to ensure the quality and the hygiene of the food, but we must also create awareness among family farmers uh, around uh, this uh, issue. Now, for farmers to be able to fully benefit from this market, and likewise for organizations to benefit from this market, we need to strengthen capabilities, we need consolidated uh, support, and uh, they need to be supported. And today, in the case of my country, the support that we receive comes from international organizations. And we still, but we still lack the support provided by the government in order to strengthen uh, family farming.
And this is something that we require in order to improve conditions. So I would now like to conclude by conveying this message in the sense that family farming needs to be supported and likewise organizations in order to have market, uh, uh, public uh, market uh, opportunities and especially when it comes to the market of school canteens. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a really interesting presentation. It is uh, crystal clear that we don't only need to organize the demand, but also to strengthen supply, supporting the family farmers. The role of um, producers' organizations, cooperatives, or other forms of association are also important to cope with uh, demand. And as we said before, the role of funding the funding of those programs. In the last presentation, she emphasized the importance of having public funding, not only as it is the, the case of uh, international cooperation, as it is in, in most cases. I'd well, like to thank all the speakers. And now we will go to the third session we will have uh, time for questions uh, for our speakers. We have already some in the chat pod. To, we will have uh, two or three rounds of questions, and then we will offer the floor to the speakers. Let me see the first round of questions, but I will start with the, the questions in the chat pod, or you can also see them in the Q&A as well as in the chat. Dick Tinsley, there was a set of uh, questions here. Maybe Lillian and Dr. Singh, you, you can... Uh, take some of them. Specifically, I believe here there's an issue here with the uh, in the low low income countries. In, uh, do the governments have sufficient funds to cover the cost of school meals? If not, what compromise do they do in balancing the lunch with the budget? Rafael Espanha também nos comparte uma pergunta que é a seguinte como podemos estabelecer um balanço how to strike a balance between the quality of uh, the quality of uh, food while avoiding the waste of uh, food Nicolas Lazarus is asking why why uh, I think this is for you, Dr. Singh. Good morning. Do you know why family farming declined in the BRICS nations in the period under the study? And uh, por último, acá, last but not least, how governments can buy when there is no when there is not enough supply in the territory and Camila Lima she's a public servant in Brazil she says that the federal institutes have 1.5 million students in Brazil and nearely half receive uh, school meals, and she wanted to know whether the funding uh, program could be articulated uh, through the Ministry of Agriculture Development. Let's start with those uh, questions. And, and yes, uh, the, the rise, the network of sustainable school meals uh, was not present today, but the next session will we'll include that together with the colleagues from the network, some of the experiences we have uh, identified with the 
coordinator of the cooperation project between uh, FAO and Brazil. Anyway, we will have those activities. Maybe if we could address the first few questions, so the see the speakers, shall we start? Uh, I don't know. Uh, starting with Dr. Singh and Dr. Uh, Sinader, then I give the floor to, to Lillian and again to uh, Madame Sizebeha. Dr. Singh? Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah. Sayal so uh, Emily is here. So uh, so there's an issue of the translation. I couldn't really hear very clearly. What, which are the, I just got a couple of questions which you would like me to answer. Uh, so, and if I miss something, you can just perhaps please repeat. So I think one of the questions was uh, around when governments can, what governments can do when there's not enough supply in the territories. Was that a question for me? Was that a question for me? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Maybe take this and and maybe some comment about the finance of this pro this kind this type of projects or programs. Okay, sorry, there was some disruption okay, in the sorry, in the sound again. Uh, okay, so very quickly, I, uh, okay, so quickly I, uh, around when governments can what governments can do when there's not enough supply in these territories. Uh, I think I can just answer. You know, I can just say a couple of things which might address some of the other questions also. That the issue of connecting school feeding to family farms through procurement mechanisms is not really always a matter of scale. That you know, what is the volume of the structured demand? I know that is a traditional understanding. Thing, that you know the structured demand has to have a significant volume a significant but it is volume. also about the catalytic value the catalytic of, of uh, school uh, feeding linkages to feeding family linkages farms to just to give you a very quick example we can have a limited number of certain uh, uh, fruits and vegetables, for example, we can have orange for sweet example, potato, or we, or we can have millets, or we can have cow peas, and the volume can be quite small, uh, uh, but they do have a catalytic uh, value in engaging uh, with small, in with family farms and enable production of, for example, orange sweet potato, 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 and linking it up to other programs that support the production of orange sweet potato, potato in terms of agricultural extension services, etc. So it's not always about scale, it's about having a catalytic effect. Even in terms of gender equity of gender again equity, it's not about scale again, because it can be very scale. small volumes very small of volume uh, certain foods which are primarily produced by women farmers produced especially during the fallow periods or produced in very small gardens uh behind uh, their homes uh or in many countries uh, women have access to very small plots of land uh, because men have uh, access to the larger piece of land and so they give certain fruits and vegetables there which can be linked to family farms so it's not really always about scale it's about their catalytic value uh so i think that sort of perhaps answers one of the questions uh and i think there's a question about the bricks i don't think that's related to family farms that figure is that the number of children receiving school meals uh, the, that, meals, that uh, the that statistic shows it declined by five percent. I am not quite sure what the reason is. I think sure that's really a function of the statistical really calculation. Statistical and in certain areas, school feeding was areas, being school feeding was being uh, uh, revised, especially maybe uh, in certain revised, states in India uh, and. Uh, in India, uh, uh, and also in South Africa, and, and so South the Africa. it was at the time of so data collection, uh, data collection uh, you know, school feeding uh, was in a position of uh, the there were some policy revisions happening in some of these countries. So that shows a minor so that reduction a minor of uh, five percent. And even uh, in all these countries, school feeding was uni is near universal. Is so it's quite uh, you so know it's quite, it, the uh, there is no the, likelihood that the trends will increase is not that much. Yeah, please let me know I've missed something. Yeah, please let me know I've missed something. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. Uh, let me give the floor to to Lilian. Lilian, talvez dá uma um comentário sobre Just a comment, especially for the funding uh, issues. Nas perguntas, talvez dá uma aprofundada nisso, se você quiser. 
especialmente também vendo como garantir a oferta, né? Aqui tem uma combinação. We have to see how we can guarantee the supply. We have a supply and a supply and demand issue because of the funding issues. But maybe if you could share with us uh, some additional things as to how it, uh, that works on a daily basis, on a regular basis. Thank you, Luis. First of all, just let me explain some things really important about Brazil. It's a national uh, school meal uh, school meals program which funds meals all the way up to higher school. And we have a model which we call co-funding. So the government allocates resources to states and municipalities for them to fund uh, school meals, and the municipality will supplement that in order to address the predation. So last year, the federal budget for uh, school meals or uh, all the way up to high school, which is around 18 years of age, before they go to college, before they go to university. This budget was uh, five billion. Five billion, five billion dollars. So the government allocates that amount for school meals, which is, uh, and, and, and then uh, resources are supplemented uh, at the other federal levels. This is a this is a huge potential market. It's the only market we work on uh, with the uh, family farming, which is a potentially high, uh, a big uh, market. Now, together with that budget, we take the budget of uh, food procurement uh, program, which is around 1 billion reais, $200 million. And uh, this is used, as I said, as an, as, a, as an experience so that the poorest uh, farmers can gain access to school meals market as well as other markets. Also, we work, as I said, uh, that the food procurement program can be the starting point for private markets as well as other uh, markets, because that's not the only one. Family farming is not the only one. I mean, it, it, it can... I mean, because we have the, those uh, markets as an alternative. And in Brazil, we have... Twenty-five, thirty years of programs for family farming. And there is a rural, very robust, a rural loan, a rural credit program today, serving nearly two million family farmers, extending uh, uh, rural loans according to the family farming characteristics. It's the, 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 the rural sector has to be uh, supported by the resources uh, from the government. So families can organize themselves. We have a rural loan at a higher uh, rate, but many people uh, receive these uh, controlled resources so that uh, we also have the technical assistance program for family farming so as to gain access to loans and other markets. We have programs uh, in order to offer to supply the, the food from family farming and to use uh, different uh, markets in the best possible way, uh, which could be the, the school meals and other uh, institutional markets. So family farming 
It's a very important in Brazil, uh, but works, uh, but has a multifunctional role. We have access to the various markets according to the different possibilities. And in fact, we have uh, farmers that use this market, this open market, or uh, in order to reach private markets and gain access to private markets. This is the example that we have with indigenous families in the food procurement program. We have the opportunity to um, buy food from indigenous families. Indigenous families, I mean, we work with uh, them, we buy and we donate. So they produce and they sell products. We authorize the delivery of these uh, food in, uh, in schools uh, from the uh, community kitchens, uh, uh, from between the indigenous communities and, and, and community kitchens. So we're trying to create additional alternatives for healthy uh, food and healthy diets. And on the other hand, we try to implement action supporting farmers to gain access to other markets other than the institutional market or school meals market where our food procurement uh, program can address. Last but not least, like uh, we understand that the number of uh, products produced it's not a problem programs that promote for these uh, families to produce more if you don't have uh, enough surface area this uh, they they, 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 they do, they, these families do other things other than agriculture. And what they could do is just to supply what they have, and we supplement that with the other farming groups. I mean, there are lots of possibilities to supply. Uh, it's not just one cooperative organization or a farmer we work with. And last but not least, this this thing about proteins. So we have a challenge there, challenge of introducing fish into uh, school meals and in the other institutional markets as well. We've managed uh, through the promotion of uh, fish processing through family farming. So the Brazilian government promoted the creation of uh, Co -op cooperatives to process fish so as to offer uh, to offer these uh, as, a, as an alternative it's a bit more difficult because these are perishable goods and we need specific transportation but at the local level this has been quite possible and it's been quite successful Thank you, Beduski. I don't know if there's another question, but that, that, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Lilian. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. For these uh, last remarks, which answers uh, many of the questions in the chat. But... Anik? Thank you. Many of the questions have been already answered to this question with the care of products. 
in the various countries. But I believe that this is just a pretext uh, used uh, 10 years ago when the school meals program was just starting with the local procurement. And we were heard that the local products were expensive, rice from Pakistan uh, uh, came to Burundi at a lower price, a lower than the local price. Family farming in Burundi has other cheaper products such as banana, for instance, such as potatoes. And as I said, all this is political will. And uh, being able to help a country at a family farming level and opening up the public markets for them. Uh, school meals, because once we have the opportunity, once the programs uh, are in place, family farmers will adjust, uh, will organize themselves, and they can produce a lot more. Uh, to in order to, uh, to cope with the demand. Of course, we cannot say that we could meet some uh, the, the demand from some uh, products for, for all the school meals. But for those products we are available, we can have we can offer this opportunity to family farmers in these areas related to these markets so that we can improve income and everything that has to do with the overall conditions that's uh, what i had it what i wanted to say thank you anik uh, let me emphasize the importance of this activity today. I mean, there is a market, there is demand. If there is a demand, then family farming will react. There is a, there is a potential, there is a dormant potential, which may and should be activated through public policies, like... Uh, Anik just said, like Lillian said, I mean, here, and, and, and the public procurement tool for, for school meals and other demands, it's extremely powerful. This is something that we can elaborate on. Anyways, I know that we want to ask more questions and listen to more experiences, but we ran out of time. I'd like to thank everyone for your valuable comments. Uh, I'd like to thank the speakers, Guilherme, Maya, Nancy, Dr. Singh, Dr. Sindera, Anik, uh, Lilian. Really, it was an excellent session. I have learned a lot with you, and I uh, thank you for that. I'd like to thank uh, Guilherme for all the support from your team at PSU. Yes, we're putting together this uh, ecosystem around family farming, which is uh, which is important. When they made the decision of approving the decade of uh, family farming, so we are meeting with those. Uh, requirements, uh, these uh, demand from the society, as well as the support from nutrition and, and, and food division. Next uh, session, on May the 2nd, we'll have the second session of this uh, round, where we will learn uh, the experiences on, on enabling tools uh, for public procurement from family farming. So, you're all uh, invited to uh, sign in for that event and hope to see you again and continue to have this fruitful discussion. All this material has been recorded and will be made available to family farming platforms. So uh, this is the first uh, uh, session of this new cycle. So thank you very much. Have a great uh, day, uh, afternoon, or evening from wherever you are listening to. Thank you.